I think when people think of nature, they're imagining some far off mountain and like a three hour car ride away. When right downstairs is nature, you know, on the ground, as soon as you step out of your building, that's nature. Welcome to the Whole You Podcast. I'm Shannon O'Brien. In honor of Earth Day, I'm introducing you to Courtney Hope Imkin, who is an interior horticulturist by trade and an earth lover by nature. Her degree in dance and art history jump-started her appreciation of the beauty of the natural world, while her familial lineage germinated her knowledge and passion for growing living things. She spends her days bringing nature inside and helping people connect to their inner tree hugger. Welcome, Courtney. How did you become inspired by nature yourself? I grew up on Long Island, New York. I kind of split my time in my mind as a child, halfway between Long Island and halfway between Maine, even though the actual time I spent in Maine was maybe a week or two out of the year. But I always felt really connected to nature. My family had a small lake house near Acadia National Park, and I spent every single moment of my childhood counting down the days until I got to go to Maine. If you look back on my old poetry books from when I was a child in English class, they're all about trees, they're all about nature. And I actually went to college for dance. My time was kind of eaten up by, you know, the artistic world and being inside studios and on stages and things. But I always kind of felt this pull to go back to nature. And that week that I got to go back to Maine always felt like the time when I could truly be myself. While I was dancing professionally, you know, I put that to the side. And actually, the first time I ever got a house plant was when I was living in Manhattan, dancing professionally. And I really just felt like I needed a little bit of life in my space. So I went to the hardware store down the street and picked up a plant that I actually still have today. I probably bought that in 2017. And it kind of reawakened this memory in me of gardening with both sides of my family. My my mom, my dad, both gardens. And then my grandmother on my father's side gardens professionally And my grandfather on my mother's side has an extensive garden. And so as I bought this house plant and it awoken my love for nature again, I created this giant (laughs) house plant collection that I ended up taking with me to Maine when I decided to move there permanently. And I had the awesome privilege of working for a great landscaping company where I worked in some homes out near Acadia National Park. As I grew more in my knowledge of outdoor plants and perennial gardens and growing food, I missed my connection to houseplants and bringing in my green space inside. So when I ended up moving to Boston, I found a really awesome company called Cityscapes based in Boston, where I luckily joined the team. And now I spend my days caring for houseplants in public spaces, offices, some private apartment buildings. We are in practice of biophilic design, the concept used within the building industry to increase occupant connectivity to the natural environment through the use of direct nature, indirect nature, and space and place conditions. And yeah, that's kind of a quick synopsis of my plant journey. Bringing nature inside your house, or in this case now with your current job, Cityscapes is also offices, bringing nature inside when you have to be inside, still having a connection to nature. Can you share your knowledge of the science behind the exchange between plants and humans? It has been scientifically proven now that just having plants in our space lowers cortisol levels, helps decrease anxiety and depression, and definitely just creates a sense of ease. And I know from personal experience too, going back and forth between city and nature and kind of not feeling very grounded and struggling with mental health issues, having plants and having something that you're responsible for really would help me manage my own mental health. You know, when when I'd look over in maybe a week where I'm not feeling well and seeing my plants droop, I'm like, you know, I can't take them down with me. You know, this is the living thing that I signed on to care for. And, you know, it's not as obviously as complex as caring for a human or an animal, but they're just as intelligent. You know, I I don't think people really give plants a lot of credit for their intelligence and the impact they have on the environment around them. 
think just having plants in the space really grounds me and really gives me a bigger perspective that like, not that I have a connection with nature, but that I am nature. Harnessing relationships between other living organisms that exist on our planet, I think is really important, not just for me, but I think for everyone to get past your ego of who you are and really just feel like a living being on earth. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> Even though I come in and out of this thinking, this non-duality, this like everything is one, we are all connected. And is that what you mean by your nature? Well, you know, humans have done a lot of physical, uh, spiritual, emotional work and reconstructing this separate reality on top of the earth that we live in, you know, all the concrete and buildings that we reside in. And especially people that live in cities where maybe the only nature you have is a tree on your block or even a small dog park, you know, down the block from you, you can kind of get lost or forget that we too are animals. <laughs> that our relationship with the earth, I feel like isn't emphasized as much as it should be. And I think that's why a lot of people struggle these days with loneliness and not feeling like a part of something greater when whether we lock ourselves behind a skyscraper, we think we're not a part of nature, but we're affected by it in every single way, every single day. That's right. All these skyscrapers are put up every single day. I don't really find it impressive when something's big and shiny and tall. I think it'd be more impressive to divest from that environment and bring something new to the environment, which, you know, the company that I work for is taking a small step in that direction of regreening spaces and allowing us to coexist with nature. One of my clients was in human resources and then wanted to reconnect with her growing up on a farm, but still wanted to live in a city. So she was talking about how do I get involved with growing rooftop gardens on buildings downtown. Do you do that with your company? I actually just had a meeting with our CEO, Jan, a few days ago, and she was talking about the rooftop garden that we helped take care of on Cambridge Street in the North End of Boston. So that's one of the opportunities that I can have outside of work to go just volunteer my time to help grow that garden. I'm definitely going to hop on that opportunity. Nice. But even growing food in a city, I really think that our society puts up a lot of barriers against growing food and making it feel really difficult and not accessible. And I think this ties in with us being a part of nature is that obviously humans, we evolved because we were able to understand the intricacies of human and plant relationships or animals as well. Um, and, and recognizing the patterns within plants, knowing what's edible, like through trial and error. I think growing food is super easy. And just for proof, I just started um, some basil seeds on my windowsill a few days ago. I just started to get a few true leaves. And so coming from Maine, where I did leave behind a, a pretty large garden with the greenhouse, I felt a little bit sad about leaving that behind. But although I can't have as much yield as I would in Maine, it is totally possible to grow food in your own home. It could be as simple as having a, a four inch pot of potting soil and sprinkling in some basil seeds and just using fresh basil on your top of your pasta, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and really reminding yourself that you do have, we do have the power to connect to nature, to feed ourselves. That's like one of, I think the most Im important things that people should understand that they have the power to do. I've been thinking about purchasing a at home mechanism to grow food. Has it had oh yeah, the hydroponic towers. Hydroponic towers. What are your thoughts on yeah. that? Kind of seems like Franken food because it's not <laughs> earth, so to speak. But can you speak more about that? Are you a fan of it? Have you used it? Would you recommend it? I am a fan. I'm actually in the works right now. We're trying to construct a hydroponic garden mounted on the wall out of um just plumbing tubes. Um, I think it is a really awesome, easy way to grow food, especially if you don't have a lot of space. Um, and the towers that people have made are when they, they kind of do the the heavy lifting for you and construct it for you. And all you have to do is drop in the little seeds. I think it's awesome. I kind of think we've been a little bamboozled into thinking that hydroponics isn't as good for you, but it's actually um, uses less water than watering a garden in soil. If you're using the correct nutrients, 
then you can have a higher yield than you could in your garden, especially since you're not fighting with the elements. If it's inside, you're not fighting with pests and you're almost guaranteed a yield. Whereas when you're gardening outside, of course, there's you're dealing with the ecosystem that also wants to benefit off the, the work that you've done in your garden. I'm a really big fan of hydroponic towers, and I think you should totally go for it. What would I start to, to grow? Salad? Spinach, arugula, kale. All of those are really easy to grow in hydroponics. They grow really fast. You know, we buy these plastic tubs of greens that are already half molded. When you can buy a pack of seeds for $2.99 from the hardware store, and you'll have a yield that will last you two to three years. And of course, if you're adding a nutrients to the water, the hydroponics, the food that you're eating is going to be more nutrient dense. The earth in general is lacking a lot of nutrients from the mistreatment of the soils with commercial farming. So I think really taking that into your own hands, I feel like one is really powerful and this two is just really great for you. So yeah, greens, number one, any herbs, your favorite herbs, basil, parsley, mint, um, mint, yeah, which I don't know about, I think growing hydroponically would be more successful because the beginner's mistake always of mint is planting it right in the ground and they have the most tuberous roots that stretch out like crazy and they will take over your entire garden. It's impossible to get rid of. I've even seen people grow tomatoes, squash, cucumbers. As long as you have some kind of trellis, anything is possible as long as you have the space for it. Pumpkin, or maybe not pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> Start small. Yeah. I think a lot of people who live in the city might be compelled to try that. I am. That's my Earth Day pact to myself is to invest in that and start growing some lettuce because I am somebody who buys that plastic tub. You know, you leave the supermarket and grab that last obligatory bag of spinach and it just like goes to rot in your refrigerator. Yeah. But I feel like I would be more connected if I grew it and I'm watching it. And it's a shame that I don't have that relationship with my food. And probably most of us that are listening to this do not have that relationship. Repurposing the sad containers of lettuce. I like to save those and fill them with maybe a layer of charcoal to prevent rot. And then you do like a layer of soil and then a layer of moss. And then that's a really great medium to grow plants because it's like a tiny greenhouse, especially to start seedlings. And I even do that for a lot of my house plants too, if I want to start cuttings of smaller plants. A little bit different with seedlings. You want to use like a, a seedling potting mix that's a little bit finer so the roots have enough room to boogie through. <laughs> I think it's really important to not fall into capitalism gardening mm -hmm. and feeling like you have to spend thousands of dollars before you have a yield that, you know, would have cost you $7 to buy a tub, but now you just spent like, you know, 3000 to get everything set up. A lot of the things that we buy, we see as disposable, like plastic bottles or those plastic tubs or, you know, glass jars from a Snapple or something. And all of those are completely viable ways to grow successful plants. What do you feel is the best source, the best resource for plant care? And maybe I can put that link in the notes. Yeah. So what I like to use is actually a book that my grandmother gave me. The book is called Success with Houseplants, published by Reader's Digest. So it gives you light, temperature, watering, feeding mixture, when to repot. And then at the back, it gives different methods of pruning, propagating, um, different soil mixtures for different types of plants. I think the easiest way to know how to take care of a plant is to research where it's native to and look up what their that environment looks like. So for instance, here, I'm sitting next to um, a philodendron Florida green, epiphytes. So an epiphyte is a type of plant that grows onto another plant. So a lot of house plants, um, like Monstera, that's a big popular one these days. Mm -hmm. Any kind of philodendron, a pothos, um, an ivy, all those are epiphytes, which means they grow on top of other plants. So they're going to want some kind of climbing medium. But it also means that they're growing you know, from the forest floor of wherever they live. And normally, you know, if you're looking at a rainforest, um, you're going to have a chunky soil, you know, lots of different, there's going to be rocks and, you know, bark that has fallen off trees. Um, it's going to be pretty moist. 
um, it's going to be really nutrient dense because, you know, obviously in rainforest, there's lots of um, life and death decay, you know, the, con the soil constantly re regenerating itself. So you want to inside of your pot, you want to mimic that environment as best as you can, which can seem like a daunting task, but I, I find it really fun. I like to make like little vignettes inside of my pots and make them really feel like the plants are at home. <laughs> making sure the leaves stay clean because, you know, our homes can get pretty dusty, which filters will help. We have air filters in our house. One, because we have a cat, but two, it does help the, the plants too, which they're already cleaning the air for us, but they deserve a little help as well. And just taking a wet cloth, or I've even heard you can dilute coconut oil if you melt it down with some water and just wiping off the leaf, keeping it shiny, making sure that it has has full photosynthesis possibilities. You know, there's there's kind of like stepping stones to being a plant parent. And, you know, I wouldn't recommend going out and getting a humidifier and a grow light and, um, you know, bird sounds <laughs> if you're just gonna have one pothos in your kitchen. But obviously as, you know, your love grows, you start to get more specified plants that with more specified care, um, the artillery gets a little bit tougher with in terms of plant care. Mm -hmm. you're gonna have bugs you're gonna have gnats you're gonna have pests and I think that's important to just acknowledge off the bat one so you don't feel like a failure if you start to see some kind of pest in your plant and two to make you realize that you know if you're bringing plants in your into your space because you want to feel more a part of nature well bugs are a part of nature you know it just they're a package deal and of course unfortunately sometimes we have to kill the bugs because they are detrimental to the plants or they can just be a nuisance especially fungus gnats so there's two great ways to get rid of fungus gnats the first way to kill the ones that are already alive if you get diatomaceous earth which is a really really fine powder it's crushed up crystal which you want to handle with gloves and a mask on because if you inhale it, you can get micro shards <laughs> in your lungs. If you just sprinkle that on the topsoil, I like to use a chopstick or, you know, the back end of a fork or a spoon, just mix that into the topsoil of the plant. That will make it so whenever the fungus knot is emerging from the soil, it will just shred their little bodies <laughs> to pieces. The issue with fungus knots too is that their life cycle is really quick and they breed like crazy. In order to get rid of the gnat, eggs, whatever watering medium you have, you take two parts water and one part hydrogen peroxide, and that will just kill all the eggs and stop their life cycle. So even hydrogen peroxide sounds like a laboratory chemical that's in a, like a beaker that I yeah. have access to. Do I get that at CVS or do I get that yeah. at plant? Place yeah, just in the first aid section. If you buy plants from big box stores, it'll come with a tag of plant care. And nine times out of 10, that if you follow that care, it's going to kill your plant. And it's it's horrible, but they do that on purpose so that you buy more plants, which is so sad. And so they're like helping you kill your plants so you'll go back and buy a new one or buy more products. Exactly that. It's hard to know what to trust because you know, miracle Grow is one company that people... It's that good American company that everybody recognizes, everybody everybody knows the name. It's pretty horrible for your plants and pretty horrible for yourself. With the power of the internet, you know, it's really easy to get a really holistic care for plants that will just be better for your health too. As a side business, I had some clients in Maine where I'd come over and just do everything that I described for them, you know, come over uh, weekly, bi-weekly, depending on how many plants they have. And I think it's important too, if you do need help, that's totally valid. It can be, especially, you know, everyone has such busy lives. If you want plants for the benefit of having them in your home, not necessarily to know what it feels like to care for them, that's totally fine. I totally support that. I think when people think of nature, they're imagining some far off mountain and like a three hour car ride away when right downstairs is nature, you know, on the ground, as soon as you step out of your building, that's nature. And a lot of the nat native species from birds, bugs, mammals, they're all suffering. We've really um, taken quite a toll off, off of uh, pretty much every native living thing um, in this country, unfortunately. And like I mentioned before with um, miracle Grow, how it's this just recognizable American company, there's a lot of that kind of same feeling inside of the landscape view business of people are told this is what you're supposed to do. 
So I'm going to do it because I want to do the right thing. And I don't think anybody, you know, the normal human consumer is actively trying to do harm in this world. Most people are trying to do good and do their best. And I think a lot of people are misled into thinking that, you know, the garden, the annual garden where you just plant the, you know, spend however much money, the planter ship from Florida, they put in, you know, a couple dozen plants in their front bed and then the plants die. The native bees don't like the pollen. And it's kind of this like sad cycle where there's so much potential. There's so much green space in Boston, especially that I, I think it's a lot of wasted potential. I really believe in people wanting to do better. And so I would love to be the beacon for the voices of the native species and helping foster that relationship between nature and human. Such a beautiful mission and so needed. Imagine if everybody could participate in that. You know, we would be breathing easier. And as you said at the beginning, our stress level would be down and we would have all of these other positive effects as well. I hear about research being done around the world, but particularly in Japan is where it seems to always come from, like this forest bathing. Just walking in nature has these the same effects that meditation does. Totally. I'm sure you're learning every day. Would you oh, say? yeah. Yeah. Never, never ending knowledge when it comes to getting to know our beautiful planet. Don't feel too discouraged by the amount of information that's out there because... It's just baby steps in fostering a relationship with, with our green planet. Yes. If there was three <laughs> little baby steps that you would recommend our audience to take in the right direction as it relates to reconnecting with the earth, what would those steps be? That's a great question. One, take a walk and go to a park and really get to know one tree. Find one tree that you really love. While you're there, notice, just try to notice how many different living things you see other than humans. <laughs> um, and I even love to take little pictures and go home and try to identify them. Um, I oh. guess that's maybe two steps. That is two steps. Do you have an app on your phone? Would that be the second step to like identify with an app on your phone? Do you use one? Yeah, I do. There is, there is an app called iNaturalist where it's actually a social media. So whenever you take a picture of a living thing, be an animal, it could be a plant, it could be a bug. It connects you to a map. It puts that picture on the map and people in your community can help you identify what the animal is. Wow, cool. And so you can follow people, uh, follow people's profiles and get to know, you know, what people's walks are looking like. Number one, go for a walk. Number two, download iNaturalist. And number three, watch a nature documentary because I feel like that's a small step. Is there one documentary that comes to mind? Called The Biggest Little Farm, and they're a farm that is based in California, and they are all about regenerative farming. That's your homework. Okay. Well, Courtney, I think you're incredibly smart and a wonderful teacher. You have so much knowledge. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your vision with us. And I'm completely inspired, not just on Earth Day. This is Earth Day, which is kind of a joke because it should be Earth day, Life. Day at Earth Life, <laughs> but we'll probably listen to this several times to get all the tips and all the goods. It sounds very complicated, like in a way, it's nature, it's natural, but there's a lot to learn. And it's incredible that you are available to visit people's houses and help them with their plants when they want to get back to nature and implement some of these techniques that will ultimately be better for them and for the planet. We're going to put your contact information in the notes below for people who are interested to reach out and hire you to help them with their green thumbs. Oh, cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>